You are listening to the Battles We All Face podcast, the show that is designed to get you from where you are to where you want to be in all areas of your life. I am your host, John Morris, and welcome to today's show. Hi there, folks. Just want to uh, welcome you to a brand new series of the Battles We All Face podcast. Uh, In this series, we are going to be uploading some brand new interviews that we have recorded over the last couple of years. Uh, They were released under a different name, so if you do hear the title of Mind, Body and Soul or anything like that, don't be concerned, it's all part of the one entity. And with that in mind, we want to welcome our very, very special guest and get on with the show. Okay, folks, and welcome to a brand new season of the Mind, Body, and Soul podcast. Boy, we are excited to have you back here, and I'm your host, John Morris, the artist, the personal development coach, and the guy that's going to help you get from where you are to where you want to be. In every one of the shows, guys, you always want to make sure you've got a fantastic beginning and an amazing end, and you've got some awesome guests in the middle. And I couldn't think of anyone any better than to begin season two than one of my personal heroes, actually, and this is a big thrill for me today. He Mm. is an author. He is uh, the author of over a dozen books, a president of a number of businesses, the host of his own sales podcast. And we're going to have so much fun today talking about why sales and marketing is vital for teenagers and for their success. He is indeed the awesome and legendary, world-famous keynote speaker, the awesome <laughs> Victor Antonio. How are you doing today, sir? World-famous. Thank you very much. Well, John. I'm over in I Scotland. I appreciate so. that. Thank you. Man. Thank you very much. Uh, you know, it, it, it's funny when you know when I was when I was coming up, so to speak. You know, I was I, I studied at the knee of like a like a Zig Ziglar or a Jim Rohn. Yep. You know, these type of speakers. And I actually got to meet uh, Zig Ziglar. That's another story that's uh, quite fantastic. But it's funny when now it's like people say things to me and they're following my stuff. It's really weird. It's kind of an out-of-body experience. It's sometimes. like when did this shift happen from going up to you're here and everything, you know, but it's incredible. Yeah, I, I had a lady, John. I had a lady run at me. I was at the airport and she is screaming, Victor, and she's coming dead at me, man. She's making beeline right at me. And she just comes up me and, man, she just grabs me and hugs me, man. My wife's like right there. I, like, I do not know this woman. I've never seen this woman before. I don't know who she is. And then she just went on to say, I'm just such a fan. I saw you on that. And she went on and on. So anyway, it's, it's kind of cool. Oh, that's kind of cool. I mean, the, the, in this day and age, that's kind of a scary thing because you never know when someone runs up to you. <laughs> I run the opposite direction. <laughs> yeah, I hear you. It was, it was cool. It was cool. Oh, brilliant. Okay, Victor, um, I'm specifically interested, actually, let's start at the beginning for you in terms of your story because it's an incredible mm. one. Share yep. with us a little bit about yourself for the audience maybe that don't know about you and, mm. and your story of growing up. All right, so I'll try to do the, the whole arc. So my, my family's originally from Puerto Rico. Right. So they moved to Chicago here in the United States uh, in the late 50s. So, you know, they had both a third grade education, a fifth grade education, spoke no English. And so we were poor. I mean, you know, we always joke. I always joke about the food stamps, the government cheese, yeah. the powder milk, right? We were just poor. And so we grew up in one of the hardest neighborhoods in Chicago. If you know Chicago mm-hmm. here in the U.S., it's a pretty uh, it's interesting, interesting. city. <laughs> yeah, that's the word I'll use. And so, you know, you know, gunshots, drugs, gangs, and all that stuff was very common. <clears throat> I was the youngest of seven, and my mother was always like, go to school, get the education, get the J-O-B. And so I was the last one, the youngest. So nobody had gone to college, really. And so I remember my father said to me, or my mother reminded me, I should say, if you don't go to college, you know, you're going to have to go work with your father at this, at this factory he worked at. It was very, I called it a black collar job because it was, John was dirty, man. I had, it was dirty. It was just horrible. My brother dropped out. He went there and he couldn't stand it for more than two months. Wow. And so I said, that's why I went to college. Went to college, got an engineering degree, got an MBA, uh, started out as an engineer. And two, three years, this was my first actually existential crisis, if I could say, is that is it two, three years, John, in, into uh, my engineering? I'm like, I don't want to do this. <laughs> But you know, but there's like sunk cost, right? It's oh, yeah. all this time you invested. And I did it all I did it for the money. That's why I got into engineering. Mm-hmm. And two, three years into this thing, I'm not, I don't like this. Uh, fast forward, I did different jobs in engineering, application engineering, systems engineering, project matter. And then uh, I got into sales by necessity because my wife said, I want to stay home and raise our kids, not have somebody else raise them. I said, I think I can make more money if I go into sales, right? And that's how I got into sales and uh, did corporate America, did well. Uh, got to the point where I was president of sales and market of a $420 million company. And then one day, May 9th, 2001, 3.48 p.m., I called it quits. 
decided to start writing books, become a speaker, which is what I wanted to do. And there was born Victor Antonio. That's incredible. I mean, that really is. I mean, yeah, how old were you between, obviously, when you started to, to when you mm -hmm. started to go by yourself, basically? The I was I had <clears throat> it's a great question because I had my first midlife crisis at 36. <laughs> I know quite young, but but here but bear with me in my rationale here. It's all that's how we think about things, right? When I hit 36, I was like, wow, I just lived two 18s, because right. you, you know your first 18s yeah. are quite memorable, right? So you're like you know you graduate uh, from high school, and then that's where you had your best friend, you met your first girlfriend, got your first kiss, all that stuff, right? So when I hit 36, I was like, wow, I lived another 18. And then I go, and this second 18 wasn't as good as the first 18. Right. Not based on my memory, yeah. right? And, I, and that, that, became, that, that started what I call the quiet discontent. And the quiet discontent is like that, that thing that just kind of just like, like a hobgoblin in the brain, that thing that just gnaws at you. You know what I'm talking about. Yeah. And a couple of years later, you know, I, that's when I quit. And so I was 38 when I decided to go solo. And my only regret is that I didn't do it sooner. That's because I just, by John, the stuff that's happened to me yeah. <laughs> since like, since 2001, <laughs> incredible. You couldn't, you couldn't script this stuff out. The experiences I've had, the people I've met, the things I've gotten to do, it's like, wow. I mean, and so when I lived my third 18, I, I was good. When I looked at the next eight, you know, set of 18s, I was like, oh, yeah, this is a, that was a good 18 right there. You know, so anyway, I'm in the fourth quarter of my 18. Wow. I'm hoping to have some overtime. See, I mean, yeah. I, I love that because, you know, I'm three years younger than when you were with them when you when you lived your second 18. And I really right. feel now, I mean, I've been doing the art business for going on 20 mm. years now. Um, right. And I start to feel like I'm finally mm. at this point in my life getting uh. it. Um, you yeah. know, as it was. And it it's just, slow, right? It's absolutely. hard though, John, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's hard. You know, to, to a degree, the art business is one of the hardest businesses for a lot of people. But when yeah. you figure out how to do it, it's no different than any other product. It really isn't. Yeah. It really isn't. I, you know, you can take any venture and make yeah. it a business Absolutely. if you want. Uh, but it, again, there's so many, you know, th this is another podcast in and of itself, right? There's so many things you need to kind of keep in place yeah. in order to move things forward. Definitely. But I, I truly believe that you can do what you want. You know, people always say, pursue your passion. Mm -hmm. I get that. But I always say, pursue your passion if it creates value. Yes. And then let's turn yes. that value into a living. Yeah, that's it. And, and you can educate yourself mm. in doing that. You know, I wanted to be a psychologist. Wow. Um, I'm coaching people now. So I'm studying psychology, philosophy, theology, and business. I've done that for years. Mm -hmm. um, so again, you've got to be willing to do what you need to do in order to get there. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I, I, think, the, the, I think that's it. Isn't it the grind? Like even yeah. today. You know what's funny, John? I didn't read, I didn't, you know, I used to like kind of cheat in college <clears throat> when it came to reading a book because I hated reading books. I, did, I have ADHD. I got it bad, right? Wow. So I, I couldn't read a book, man. You know, it's like I, I never really read a book cover to cover. Yeah. I would skim it, try to get the cliff notes, you know, the whole thing. It's funny when I had this, this crisis, my first crisis when I, you know, became an engineer three years later, I don't want to do this. That's when I began reading. And on, on the pre-interview, we kind of talked about, yeah. you know, reading all these different authors, different uh, philosophers, That's existentialists, it. It. the social, uh, the sociologists and all that to find myself. And to this day, I am now like, a, like you, an yeah. avid reader, That's it. you know, and I think it's so key for people to keep, it sounds so trite and cliche, but it's so key to keep learning yes. and yes. moving. Yeah. Absolutely. And I completely agree. And I think... You know, because when I'm coaching clients now, it's one of the most interesting things they expect you to give them, almost like the party mm. line kind of thing. And you come out with something completely different, like you choose yeah. how you respond or whatever it might be. And they're like, oh, wow, that's different. That's something really unique that a lot of coaches, like we were talking about in the pre-meeting, mm. they don't cover. But Victor, I want to put mm. you on the hot seat now if I can. Do it, man. Okay. Oh, I love the hot seat. Okay. Do it. Tough questions. I love tough questions. Go. You, 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 I'm sure you'll have an answer for this one. What do you believe are the two most important things that, re mm -hmm. with regards to a teenager's future, the two most important things that they can learn? The big one is communication. I used to undervalue that so much. Communication, which is the verbal art of having a conversation mm -hmm. with somebody. And then the second one would be presentation. You could be a C average student. Hell, you can be yeah. a D student, man, <laughs> on the border of failing. 
And But if you have great verbal skills, like you can articulate ideas well or, or whatever it is you're trying to get across, and then you tie that into being able to present, yeah. you know, I, I mean, those two, that's the one too. So if you're listening to this, you go, what can I do to become great? I'm telling you right now, if you're listening to me and you're a young person, I'm telling you, if you read, you become very articulate. If you learn how to present, I joined Toastmasters, which is an organization. I don't know if it's over. It's probably over there as well, right? I think so, it's yes. A, it's a speaking organization that you can just join. It doesn't cost that much where you learn how to be a good presenter. And combining those two things, those are two skill sets that will never, you know, they'll always have, you know, extended shelf lives because what people want, anybody can learn, you know, technology, anybody can learn certain, you know, the tools or, or skill sets. But being able to talk mm -hmm. and communicate, man, that's big. I completely agree. Uh, and, and that's, it's funny. I mean, my own two that I thought you were going to come out with mm. was sales and marketing. Um, mm. but they well, that are, is, by the yeah, way, that is. Yeah, that's that is it. sales and marketing. I mean, marketing, in, in my definition, is basically just telling people what mm. you do. Yeah. I, I, I can't no. see it in other ways. <laughs> No, no. I, I, so, so my story there, you probably heard my story, but I'll, I'll repeat it again for the benefit of those who have it, is that, so I, May 9, 2001, I decided to go on my own, right? At that time, John, I think my base salary was like 250000 Wow. Average average commission check was two, three hundred. We should actually that. say though that <clears throat> to live in the States, because I found this with one of my co hosts, that you need like a hundred grand just to be able to over here is much different. But in the yeah. States, you need a lot of money to be able to live a decent quality of life. I think, yeah, I mean it really depends on, you know, what where where in the US you live. Mm -hmm. For example, if you live in California, that's that's a very true statement, or yeah. New York. Yeah. Uh, if you live in the Midwest, you can probably get away with less. But I think the I think we found here that right now today as we we're talking I think seventy to eighty thousand is kind of the number wow. you need, you know. <laughs> and so so anyway, so you know you're banking half a million. I'm banking half a million dollars a year. Got stock options, the whole thing. I decide to go solo, right? I quit. Mm -hmm. Like all right, I'm doing my thing, man. You know my own thing. And in my first six months, because it was uh, May when I quit, so June really is when I launched. June July, uh, in six months, I made a whopping killer amount of money called seventeen thousand yes. dollars by the way that's one seven for those of you who are not hearing not 70 and, one seven and the conversion 17. for that folks is about fourteen thousand maybe thirteen thousand pounds you know you talk about a fall from grace right <laughs> and so i remember i went to see a guy his name was randy gage and i remember because this guy was he was doing it. He was killing it. You learn from the best, yeah. right? You mimic the best, you imitate the best, you emulate them. And so I went to see him speak, paid my money, went to hear him speak. And I remember I made sure to sit next to him during lunch. And so I, I, I start talking to Randy and I might, I pull out my giant violin, right? Woe is me. Start playing that <laughs> little, little song. That's, <laughs> and I start talking, ah, it's not going well. I'm trying to do this. Right? And then Randy looks at me and he says, Victor, what business are you in? I go, Dude, I thought I was just telling you what business I was in. I was I was in this, you know, the sales training business. He goes, No, no, what business are you in? I go, well, okay, I'm in the speaking business. He goes, No, no, what business are you in? I'm in the training business. No, no, what business are you in? I'm in the consulting business. Victor, what business are you in? I said, well, basically, I wanted to say, damn it, you tell me what business I'm in, because apparently I don't know. And that's when he said, You're in the marketing business first, yeah. everything else second. And that was like, you know, when you first hear something you don't want to hear or not ready to hear, you're like, screw you. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Screw you. And I was like, you know, bollocks, as you guys would say on that <laughs> side of the pond. Bollocks, right? And so, uh, but, you know, you know, when you hear the truth, though, and it finally hits bottom, you go, he's right. And that's when I learned to become a great marketer. Mm -hmm. And so to your point, you're absolutely correct. When it comes to building your business, really you're doing, when, by the way, it, what it really becomes to do, defining your independence. If well, you like can that. master <laughs> the art of sales and marketing, right? Because those sales will drive the, that's where you close the business. Yeah. <clears throat> marketing is where you attract the business. Mm -hmm. But I'll still say that both require verbal skills yes. and presentation yes. skills yes. to close it. Yes. And that falls under the, like it, it falls under either sales or marketing, mm -hmm. depending on how you want to parse it. That's brilliant. I mean, for me, you know, I, I grew up watching wrestling, you know, that's how I learned how me to, too, by the way, well, I loved wrestling. Well, well, and that's how I learned how to talk because with dyspraxia, with all the things that's there. <laughs> wait, 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 yeah. we got to stop you here. You, 
I don't you learn how to talk for wrestling. Now, I, hey, get... I should clarify this. By talk, I mean being able to do promos, being able to do intros, okay. being able to hold okay. the conversation, and to have energy behind it, not as in one, two, threes, ABCs. <laughs> okay. <laughs> the I used to watch wrestling when I was young, but but you know the artist showmanship marketing yeah. is there, of right? It, it really is there. Yeah, and the things that you can actually learn from it because we've had some wrestlers, some of the biggest names actually on the show, and uh, you know when you get that, it's like wow, I'm meeting my heroes, and the downtown worth and we talk mm. like what we're doing now um sure. but it's it's phenomenal but victor earl nightingale who is obviously both one of yeah. our heroes mm. sadly no longer sure. with us um his formula on how mm. to get a job which is basically if you go there i, th I can't because i think it was you that taught on this recently that basically any person that is offering you a job an employer is looking for four things one that you're going to be a good fit you're going to work well with the team you can increase sales decrease outgoing and improve customer service that's what yep. I got from Earl Nightingale. I teach this a lot now to clients one-on-one, -on -one, as I know you have as well. But this isn't being taught in schools and colleges. There's a lot that isn't being taught in schools and colleges. Sure. And in the institution, in your opinion, why do you think that, you know, in my, well, I suppose the basics um, of preparing kids and teenagers for that next step isn't really being covered in the institutionalized education mm. systems? Oh man, that's a rabbit hole. That's more of a that's more of a, a political bureaucratic rabbit hole that you don't want to go down. But but I but I think it's sad because, you know, I mean, if we just took the opportunity, yeah. Well, here let's take a step back. You know, Ebbinghaus is a guy who talked about the retention curve, and mm -hmm. typically you forget what is. What did he say? Within twenty four hours, you'll yeah. forget seventy five percent. Within thirty days, you'll forget ninety yeah. percent. And the ten percent you're able to recall, five percent of that is correct, which means you don't really remember a lot. And it's sad because. It's almost like we're, you know, and I'm talking about here in the U.S., yeah. we're still aligned with the Industrial Revolution mm -hmm. in, in terms of what we teach yeah. and how we teach. And because the school system becomes so politicized and so bureaucratic and so hard in their structure. I love the facial not expressions there. <laughs> yeah, because, it, because, you know, you see some of the stuff they're teaching. Yeah. You're like, well, and nobody does that anymore. Nobody does it like that. And, and the basic tools of managing your finances, mm -hmm. for example. Little simple things like, you know, how, how to, today, for example, you know, if I hear somebody say, well, how to manage your checkbook, well, we don't have checkbooks anymore. It's all online, right? And we don't understand how money works. Yeah. That's the other problem. And so we don't understand how money works. We don't even understand how business works. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we don't teach entrepreneurialism mm -hmm. or sales yeah. at, let's say, at a young age. Let's call it high school, which for us is like, you know, the ninth grade through the 12th grade which is probably a prime time to uh, start Absolutely. teaching this stuff. And I, I, I think it's sad that our curriculum doesn't include that. Now, there's an empowering fact in that the internet today is becoming to me like the ultimate freedom machine, if you really think about it, because you don't need a degree to succeed. No. Now, so let me, put, let me put a fine point on this because I, I, there's always an asterisk that goes at the bottom of this, okay? Like Elon Musk uh, about, I don't know, six, seven months ago said that, right? You don't need a degree yeah. to be successful, but there's always a but in this world, man. There's always a but. You had to really listen to what he said. If you have extraordinary skills, right, that that you can use, that, don't, for example, you're a great programmer and you have extraordinary skills that you've developed on your own, you don't need a degree. Now, if you don't have extraordinary skills, I don't know, maybe you should think about getting a degree to kind of give you a head start if you don't know where to begin. So I always say that because I have two degrees, mm -hmm. and for me, they have paid off in spades, yeah. man. My, yeah. my, my engineering degree is, to this day, we're talking three decades later, this thing is still paid off <laughs> because I understand concepts that are very rudimentary. Mm -hmm. They say, you know, just basic principles you have to understand about technology, and still, they don't change. So to me, when, we, when I look at the educational system, I, I'm saddened by the fact that most most kids won't learn about yeah. money till they're well into their 20 and 30s. And that sometimes it's a little too late. Mm -hmm. They bad habits have been formed. They don't know that they can start their own business or how to start their own business, which to me is the ultimate freedom. And the two are kind of intertwined, John. Yeah. And sorry for the long rant, but no, I'll no, end on okay. this. And that is when you learn about how money works and then you learn how to be in your own business, start your own business, that's the ultimate freedom because slavery today to me modern day slavery is debt 
you know, yeah. and people say, yeah, debt is good. Debt is good. Okay. Well, again, everything comes with a little asterisk. Never believe in absolutes. There's a lesson for everybody. Never believe in absolutes. Like it's either this mm -hmm. or that there's lots of shades of gray. So yeah, you know, debt can be good if you if leverage correctly, but it comes with an asterisk with yeah. the risk, but everybody I see, you know, I should say, uh, the show I had, did I mention the show I had, Life or Debt? Um, no, that was actually, I did come across that in your notes. Um, I didn't have yeah, time yeah. to jump into it, but yes, go, go ahead, talk about that. So, well, so I did a reality show. It's called Life or Debt. You can find it on Amazon or Hulu. And no, I don't get a percentage if you buy anything. So, But, but I, 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 would, I would check out the program because what it is, I, I did a whole season where I, I would visit a family that was struggling financially, John. And then uh, I spent five days with them trying to, change their mindset, right? Yeah. Correct them. And then I come, I give them all the tools they need. I come back in 90 days and see where they're at. And what's interesting, the number we used at the time, which is like five years ago for the show was that 75% of American families live in paycheck to paycheck. Yes. Now listen to that 75. So when you, when you look over at the American landscape with much envy, be careful. Uh, so 75% of living, uh, you know, paycheck to paycheck. And I would venture to guess because of pandemic, that number has gone up. Uh, the amount of debt people carry depends, but it, it's somewhere between 80 to $120,000. It's a lot. Average credit card debt is like 34 to $40,000. Uh, if you throw in like school, mm -hmm. uh, that's another $50,000 in debt. And that's not counting mortgage, yeah. a house. My, my point to all that is that, you know, if you're a young person listening to this, you need to kind of just slow down and understand how money works and realize that being in debt is modern day slavery. Yes. Because what happens is when you owe money, you can't do what you want to do. You always have to service that debt. And, and on, the, on the flip side, on the entrepreneurial side, the best way to get out of debt is you're not going to get it by a company saying, you're great. Yeah. Oh, here's your 3%, which barely keeps up with the rate of inflation. You want to do your own thing eventually. Yeah. I think, now, by the way, this is not to say, again, asterisk, no absolutes. This is not to say there aren't great companies out there that you can work for that, that and, and people who have corporate jobs, it's a bad thing. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is that the ultimate control for freedom lies in building your own yeah. thing. And, and I completely agree with that. And it, it's incredible, actually. Um, and th this is, this is you know, not in my notes at all. But it's amazing how many people then have this victim mindset. And I don't know about you, Victor, I'm, because you worked, mm. obviously, a lot longer and a, with a lot more people than I have. But one of the things I find is even when you can present a solution or an mm. option to somebody mm. that might be living in disability, particularly in the United States, and you could say, look, if you start doing affiliate sales with XYZ, you're going to have money coming in. And you've got people there the the biggest thing that i hear all the time is well I, i'd lose my disability and i said well how much is your disability per year i, don't, I can't remember what it is say sixteen thousand, <clears throat> and they will turn around and say but i'll lose that I said, but what about if you could earn thirty two thousand, or you know fifty thousand, or whatever it might be yeah. and th again it's that whole mentality and that's what comes back to me um from studying psychology where it is all about the thoughts. It's all about the mindset. You know, life is not mm. what happens to us. It's how we respond. And it's always, it's always the voices in your that's head, it. John. You know, it's, it's the, you know, in the case of the disability, it's fear, right? Mm -hmm. It's fear of losing that. But if you say, you know, but by the way, from a sales standpoint, here's how I would have that objection. Uh, but I'll lose my disability. I said, oh, yeah, I want you to lose <laughs> yeah. your disability. And I want you to earn more than what you get on disability. Let me help you, yeah. right? You lean into that objection. But what's interesting is that you're, you're so on point because what I've learned is that unless you can manage the voices in your head, <laughs> there's no better way of putting yeah. that, yeah. that you really can't be successful because those, again, those negative thoughts, right? You know, uh, they're all, what, what one guy calls them ants, mm -hmm. automatic yeah, yeah. negative yeah. thoughts, ants. There's one guy who talks about that. Uh, I, I, I read, you know, many years ago, I read a book by Dr. Martin Seligman, okay. his book called Learned Optimism, who is the founder of positive psychology. And by the way, positive psychology, for those who don't know, is not woohoo, you're the best, you're the greatest, not that. It's, it's why people who are optimistic tend to be more successful. Mm -hmm. And it really came down to, he called it, I think it was self-explicatory style. It's how, when something, as you pointed out, when something happens to you, how do you explain it to yourself? Yes. And you can, you can take a victor or a victim mentality, you know, and the, the victim mentality is, well, I could never do that. I'm not that good. Things will never change. That's not for me. You know, that never thing, good things never happen to me. 
that's the victim mentality. The victor says, oops, well, that didn't work out. How do we, how do we make it work now? Exactly. What do we need to change? Totally different mindset, yeah. right? But the thing is as well, have you noticed that when the difference of mindsets can literally be the difference of centuries, years, decades between being successful and actually getting where you want to be and staying stuck forever because all mm -hmm. we do once a situation has happened good or bad um and this this is a side note from a philo philosophical mm. point mm. but once a situation has happened good or bad it's it's over it's done with the only thing that can keep it alive is us through our memories and our imagination and i think uh, by the way that that right there and i'm glad you brought that up because many people don't bring that up and I'm I, getting, you know, I'm getting it, affirmation from Victor Antonio. I love this. No, 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 because no, because well, you know what you're talking about, man. You don't need me. I'm just here to kind of help you have a conversation, because you, you're a smart guy. Because memory and imagination are two things that are very destructive. Can be beneficial Absolutely. or destructive, yeah. but everything is memory, really, mm -hmm. right? Every negative experience you had is a memory. Yeah. And the thing is, some people recall their memories too often. Yes. It, it's it's amazing how. And, and uh, you know, parents who are, if they're listening to this, will get this. Let's say you one day you're at the store, at the grocery store. Little Johnny gets out of hand, right? Little Johnny gets out of hand, and all of a sudden you go, you yell at little Johnny, right? Little Johnny Morris, right? <laughs> you yell at little Johnny, right? And, you know, for some reason, the parent will remember that yes. and say, oh, yeah. such a horrible parent. How could I have done yeah. that in public? Yelled at poor little Johnny. I probably killed, you know, and destroyed his <laughs> ego and probably messed him up for life. But what's interesting is that you did about a thousand things right for little Johnny up to that yeah. point. But it's it's interesting how we dampen the good things we've done, mm -hmm. but we amplify the negatives. Yeah. And we do that to ourselves. And that's where I think the negative imagination or the negative memories kick in. I completely agree. And I think that then leads on to the messages that we tell ourselves. Because again, we, um, my business partner and I, we have just finished teen life coaching. It was a seven week long mm -hmm. program. And, wow. uh, you know, it was we had kids from the United States, kids from over here, and we just sat down with them and we examined self image and we examined relationships and we examined finances and all that kind of stuff. Basically, a foundation for them to build and to change a life. And one of them that I uh, personally had written for this course was all about the thoughts. And, mm. you know, you can tell yourself, and again, people have the conversation with their, in, you know, in their internal structure all the time. We cover mm -hmm. this on the show and they'll sit there and say, well, I am. And it'll be negative, you know, they, they would say they're no good, they'd say that they're rubbish, they'd say that they're ugly. And I said, right, well, let me be your internal voice. And I do this for 30 seconds. I say, how do you feel? And they say, well, I feel like crap, to be honest with you. I said, right, give me 10 seconds now. And I, and I my body, I, I square onto the camera and my body posture changes. And then I start fueling energy. And I, you, you literally just feel it. And I say, you know, what about if you just say, rather than all those negative things, I am love, I am peace, I'm amazing, I'm wonderful. Heck, I tell, mm. I tell people, honestly and openly, I'm a genius. Um, and I don't, right. I don't have an issue mm. there with saying that because to me a genius is being an expert in your field and the fact mm. that i've chosen and studied so many things for 20 years you know they say it only takes three to be an expert so where, where, where am i at no. but, but yeah. because i believe that and like we said before it's like it's then how everything else opens up and equally would you want to you know meet a psychologist that said mm, i'm not really that good a brain surgeon that said oh, i don't really know what i'm doing or someone that was labeled mm. as a genius and and that's a different thing. So when you do that, and especially with teenagers, to change that mindset, um, you, sadly, you're not going to get through to everybody because some of them are so stuck in, you know, in the, in that mindset of well, they're no good, and the, the there's a, there's a lot of there's a lot of deep wounds there. Yeah. I, I think one of the things that Seligman said in the book that I thought was interesting his his style was to challenge the person's belief system, yes. and I thought that was really interesting. Uh, so, for example, somebody says, "Well, I'm not good with technology," to which I always say, "Nice cell phone you have there." Yeah nice mobile do you know what i mean and they go what does that mean Victor? that's a piece of technology you know if somebody says i'm not good at whatever i go i believe if i ask you a couple of questions i can find when you've done that yeah. i'm not good at interviews really how'd you get to your last job <laughs> something must have gone right yeah. for you do you know what i mean yeah. and if you challenge people's belief system i think they begin to kind of question yeah, where's that negative stuff coming yeah, from? Yeah, and then to yeah, I think I was just gonna say then you know if if they say that you know well they're not good at such and such it's like well let's reframe that and say you might not be right now but you can learn you know you give sure. them that possibility for for sure. I love that by the way, and that and that's a great way of looking at it because a lot of people think right out of the gate they should be good at yeah, something. Definitely. No, we we live in this microwave society, right? Like to put it in there, two minutes later, boom, it's there. It doesn't work that way. Yeah. 
And so everything is just, I hate to be again, cliche, but it's a journey. You're trying to get somewhere it. and it's a lot of work and effort yeah. to get there. I mean, big biceps don't just come like that. Even if you do, as so many people do take the juice, I did it naturally yeah. and it took years, you know, and it's, it right. is that process. Victor, and it's that so dedication and discipline, man. And, so I respect well, I that. I mean, that's that's a whole other thing. Uh, for me, that's one of the biggest lessons they can yeah, learn. That's a big one. That's a big one. Yeah. Because they would say, "Oh, well, I've been in business six months and it hasn't worked." It's like I've been in business twenty know. years. You know, <laughs> that's what I mean. It, it's like it's like everybody wants it now. It's the Do you know what because I mean? we're like, in the in the in the instant click um, yeah. society. And I think, I think if you're a young person, I said, man, I said, you know, one of the things I, I get this question all the time. So Victor, what would you say to your younger mm -hmm. self? I say, I, I would be very kind to myself. Yeah. I said, dude, it'll all work out. Just keep moving in the right direction because I think that's the real answer. Yeah. When I turned 50, I did something interesting. Uh, I, I, I gave myself the greatest gift, truly the greatest gift, even wrote a book around it. And the greatest gift of 50 was the gift of forgiveness. Now, let me be specific. What I mean by that is I actually had this conversation with myself. I said, all right, from this moment on, this is at 50, right? At this moment on, all your screw-ups, all the things you did wrong, everything can no longer be brought into conscious thought when considering any future endeavors. Brilliant. What do I mean by that? So you know how sometimes we're about to do something, like, oh, and, and that, that voice inside, well, you remember the last time you screwed that up? I go, and then now my immediate question is, hey, was that before I was 50? <laughs> and the, other, the other voice goes, yes, it was. Oh, can't count that thought. And so wow. all of a sudden I've squelched all yeah. my thoughts before 50 and it's almost like I call it also erasing the board. Mm -hmm. I've erased the board of all my screw ups and said, all right, we start fresh now. And no matter, you don't have to wait till you're 50, but I wish I'd done that earlier that if you just kind of say to yourself, look, you've screwed up. If you're a young person listening to me right now, oh man, you've screwed up so many times. You've probably done some embarrassing crap. Welcome to the club. You're normal. There's not one person yeah. on the, that's roaming this planet that Absolutely. hasn't screwed up, done something stupid, has so many regrets. Yeah, you're normal. But it's that point of forgiveness. Whenever you decide that age is, I think that's when a new beginning begins. I think as well, I think that's a really awesome point as we wrap up the show that, you know, but for me, it's, it's the wisdom that you learn through all of those experiences. Mm. They always have something at least to be able to teach. Uh, and that's the way I look at it now as well, for, for sure, uh, which is phenomenal. So the victim. Yeah, it's, hey, by the way, I, I just want to empathize with young people. It is painful yes. to yes. go through some of the experiences. I mean, just painful. You're like, oh, I'm such an idiot. Oh, I'm so stupid. And it's just painful. It's gut wrenching, painful. Yes. But I want you to know, man, that once you go through that, what happens is you're going to, by the way, forecasting, as you said, John, uh, you'll probably screw up again. <laughs> you'll do some stupid again. And, but it's like with every iteration, it becomes less painful yeah. and you learn a little more and you minimize those screw ups. Yeah. So and, and the, hang in the, there, the man. The crazy stuff is as well, I, I learned this the other day that the reason teenagers do, because uh, you've got kids, haven't you, Victor? Two kids. Two kids. Well, they're, they're adults now, right. but they're not kids anymore. Okay, so, the, the, and I didn't know this. I, I was studying with MIT, uh, Massachusetts Institute of uh, Technology the mm. other day for psychology. And they walk people through uh, this one particular lecture and it was why teenagers do the stupid stuff. And it's because you've one part of your brain that is, you know, absorbing things really quickly and developing things really quickly. And the other part of your brain that's absorbing it slowly. The sad thing is the part of your brain that's developing slowly is the part that's your rationale, your no normal yeah. behavior. <laughs> so that is the real. And I was like, oh my goodness. I was texting parents to yeah. say, this is what yeah. this is about. <laughs> so yeah, it, it's. It, I think they call it almost like the reflective part of your That's brain. It. Yeah, that gives you that, that room to yeah. think about what you're about to do. Yeah. We don't have that. It's not developed. So to some extent, it's not your fault. That's your it. brain isn't developed yet. I think by it was it age of 26, uh, 27 yes. is when you. It varies, but that's yeah. the, around the age where you start to get kind of a little more wisdom going. So the, the frontal lobe cortex, yourself. I think it was, that's developing slowly, and then the secondary core, you know, and, and all this kind of stuff. So, yeah. but uh, Victor, as we wrap up the show, is there anything you know that you want to close on um, as any encouragement, any thoughts that you have right now? Man, I think we covered a lot of good stuff on, on this conversation. I, I think the the be kind to yourself is yeah. one. Uh, you know, and if you're again, if you're a teenager listening to this, I mean. What is that? What is that? Maybe you'll, you'll know. That. There's a phrase that says, be kind to everybody because everybody's going through their own yes. personal yeah. war or something. Right. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, and so everybody's struggling yeah. with something. And for some reason, as I get older, that phrase is becoming more and more yeah. central in Definitely. my life. 
And so, you know, if you're a young person and you think you're the only one that has angst, eh, no, you're not. Everybody's dealing with yeah. it. Maybe they just put on a better face, a better That's mask, right. but everybody's dealing with something. And if they're not dealing with it today, they'll be dealing with it tomorrow. So one, again, don't be so hard on yourself and maybe be, be a little kinder to other people also. There's no, don't try to one up other people you know, and piss on their parade just yeah. to make yourself feel better. That's never a winning strategy. Definitely. Focus on you, be good, do good, and you'll be good. I love that. I mean, that's a fantastic way. And for me, folks, it would be a case of, you know, stuff will happen. There's, there's guarantee stuff will happen, good or bad. But a lot of it is how you choose to respond. And yeah, like Victor says, you may screw up and you may screw up big. He has, I have. Um, majority of 8.6 billion other people have. But the reality <laughs> is that if you sit there and dwell on it and say, oh man, 20 years ago, I should never have done that. Never should have done that. Hey, you know, that's 20 years of your life that you've been sitting there dwelling with that as opposed to 20 minutes where you said, man, I should never have done that. How can I improve going forward? And yeah. that's where the whole teaching on emotional intelligence comes in. Um, yeah. But Victor, I've had a blast with you today. Thank you so much for being my special guest today. It's been a, it's been an honor. It really has. This has been fun, man. This has been fun. The pre-interview was fun. This was fun. Thank you for having me it's on. It's a man. pleasure. And I hope we get to do it again because there's so much more to cover. And so as we wrap up, where can folks find your books, Victor? If you just go to victorantonio.com or just type in Victor Antonio, you will find me because I'm all over the internet. Absolutely. That's phenomenal. And folks, you know, you can come and find us at thebattlesweallface.com. Uh, you can check out the brand new book and we're working on all sorts of new stuff right now. Of course, the courses and all the other stuff that go along with it. We've got something. We hear you. We hear your cries. If you struggle with anxiety, we've got a brand new course on that and finances and all the stuff that Victor and I have actually been talking about in the show. And that's available at thebattlesweallface.com. So until next time, folks, take care. God bless. Make sure to like, share, and subscribe. Tell a friend because it could be the very thing that they need in their hour of darkness. And I've been your host, John Morris. He has been the also Victor Antonio. And we'll catch you next time. Take care. Good, 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 my friend. There we go. Awesome. Brilliant. Yeah, Thank you awesome. so much. That was wonderful. That was a great conversation. I haven't had a good one like that in a while, man. That's a good conversation because it's it's like, um, I think you get it at another level. You know, everybody talks about sales and stuff like that. So it's always nice to kind of go off-road a little bit and talk about the the psychology of why people succeed and why they don't. Yeah. I mean, I was, I was so, almost taught by one of the best. So <laughs> Yeah, Earl Nightingale. Yeah, you were. <laughs> See, Napoleon Hill, I, I was having a conversation with someone the other day and we got talking about heroes and I said, I've got six heroes. And I said, I've got, there's two of them that are remaining and Victor Antonio is one and Donald Miller is the oh, other. Oh, that's cool. Man. That's um, nice, man. That's nice. Because Hopefully I didn't disappoint you. You no. know how they say you never want to meet your idols? <laughs> well, you certainly didn't because I knew, you know, full of energy and full of life. And if ever, you know, yeah. you get one of those wild hairs one day and you say, you know, I want to do a podcast that's for teenagers. Drop me a message because yeah. I think we could, <laughs> we could draw some amazing yeah. content. I almost said no. I almost said no to you, I think, because I was like, oh, I don't really like talking to teenagers. You know what I mean? That, I, I got to be honest. I was yeah. like, oh, I don't really like talking to you. It, it's not that I don't like talking to them. Sometimes I feel I can't connect. Uh, but then I go, but then it kind of, you know, I let it sit there for a while. And I said, well, I don't know, maybe through this podcast, you know, something will come of it and I can connect. It's not that I don't like teenagers. Sometimes I feel I don't connect with them. If, if it's a consolation, uh, I don't like babies. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> there's just something weird and strange but yes something not right something not right yeah all right john i'm gonna let you go man congratulations gonna... on the book and thank you for letting me on thank be you honest, it's okay? a pleasure victor you take care have a great day take care brother see you brother bye-bye prior to the show victor and i got to hang out a little bit and for your listening and viewing pleasure we want to share that conversation with you right now shadows cast by the flames that's on the it. wall that's it and that's uh, well that's the yeah. crazy thing because people will say oh no it's definitely this and i'm like because i am yeah. as, as you'll find out i study a lot of things and i love them all but you know all we have in our perspective is literally what i can see out of the window right now and if Absolutely. you never move that's it so how can i make then an informed decision and i yeah. talk to folks all over the place because i was involved with church ministry for a long time and uh, they say oh, i'm searching for truth and I'm reading books. I said, uh, what books are you reading? And they say, oh, I'm reading, for the, I'm reading the Bible, cover to cover. And I'm reading this and that. And uh, I said, are you reading the Quran? Are you reading the Torah? Are you reading any of the holy books that's there? And they're like, no, why would I? I was like, uh, how can you be <laughs> seeking complete truth then? You know, if this is what uh, you, you, you and I, you and I will get along with, really I'm well. Sure we will. I mean, I've I've studied you and followed you a lot of yeah. my professional career, um, oh. and uh, I just love your energy. I love uh, you know your teaching as well. But I say that, and they look at me, and, and they're like, "Well, what do you mean?" And I said, "What you're going to have is you'll have a truth." 
but it right. will be in Christianity. <laughs> you know? That's right. It's all context based. That's what do you want to look at? Yeah. And you know, it's funny. You know, it, it, one of the things I've learned as I get older, obviously, is that when I get into discussions with people and there's some disagreement, I always now take a step back yeah. and say, well, let's begin with definition. Yes. Yeah. That has been the greatest lifesaver in terms of, you know, uh, salvaging great conversations. Well, let's begin with definitions. Yeah. Then, like if you say, what is truth? I said, okay, well, that's just going to take us, you know, your truth versus my truth. That's a rabbit hole we can go down, but at least we know <laughs> we're going down two separate rabbit holes, right? We could agree to disagree because they're yeah. two separate rabbit holes. <laughs> so but that's it. and it's, it's amazing when you're actually able to have that conversation with people, because now, I mean, I've reached a point in my life through uh, uh, an amazing series of events this year. It, it has been phenomenal where mm. I'm just completely at peace with things. I just see things in such a different way now. And oh, um, I feel I feel that, man. I well, feel that. Actually. Well, I mean, I, I, I left the church in 2015, uh, 2016 from and it was a lot of political stuff. I, I mean, I worked sure. with them for 12 years and it was a lot of political stuff. And just yeah. I, I left with baggage, like a lot of baggage, a lot of anger. And I don't know if you're familiar with Dr. Wayne Dyer. Is he, oh, is, yeah, is, man. Right. OK, so he was, that was my back in the day guy. Man. Right. That was back in the 80s. I used to listen to Wayne Dyer. Well, well, listen to this, because this is incredible. Last year, a member of our team um, said, have you ever thought about writing a book? And that's what now is there. And I became an author and uh, another another creative skill. What, what is the book? What is the book? So the, the book is called The Battles We All Face. And uh, as you can see there, I, I ended up in a suit of armor because, you know, it, it kind of logical. <laughs> why, why not? Right. But, well, why not? It. But I took all the, the life lessons um, that I had learned maybe over the last 10 years, put them yeah. into this book. And um, let me see. I uh, I put them alongside my artwork. Are those like and, black pages? Like at, that looks cool. So oh, it was really different. Nice. I put my artwork oh. with it. I put a lot of stuff that was there. But this basically was, because you know you get a lot of self-help books and they say the same thing over and over again over the yeah. period of about 100 pages. This is 110 pages and each page is a chapter. And I was like, how can I get what I need to say really condensed and really yeah. focused? So people read it and it's almost like a devotional kind of thing. Um, sure. But to, to, to get back, to, so I was writing that last year and it came out in September. Uh -huh. Congratulations, by Thank the way. You Congratulations. That, 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 that's no small feat. Well, I'm actually working on a brand new novel uh, series right now. It's a series of uh -huh. 10 books. Um, I, I do a lot of things, as you'll find, and it's called Out Through the Ages, uh, which was mm. originally a documentary series that I started filming uh, before lockdown. And uh, I, I could feel stuff building up inside me, you know, maybe a couple of weeks ago. And I was yeah. saying to my wife, I was like, Man, I, I need to I need to write this story. Because only when you start making an art history docudrama do you see actually how big this thing is. Um, so I start working as I start writing. We're now 11 days in and it's, it's nearly complete. Oh, wow. I sat down, channeled the divine spirit and it literally just flowed right just out in front of me. I couldn't yeah. stop it. But what happened and, and the, the purpose, even with you and I meeting today, it, it, it's all uh. really crazy on how it all happened. Um, you know, you, you leave, you're filled with baggage, you're filled with anger and hate and all that kind of stuff. And I sat down and I was sitting here and Wayne Dyer came on YouTube. I had my ears plugged in, headphones on, whatever. And uh, his everyday wisdom teaching came on. And I kid you not, within two hours, every piece of anger, every bitterness, everything had gone completely. Interesting. Wow. It was incredible. And then I... Well, I started to study psychology then and philosophy and I just what, what, started but, but, but John, what do, you, what do you think that was? What do you think you heard that would allow that outrush if, of all that? If, stuff if I'm honest there? with you, I would, because again, you know, I was raised for a long time and I worked in the Christian tradition in a long time, sure. but I always saw God very, very different to other people. Right. And never had a problem with that. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, it was literally, I believe, God flowing within me and getting that garbage mm -hmm. out because I then encountered Wayne Dyer. I then encountered Earl Nightingale, who I know is one of your favorites. Yeah. Yeah. I but wait to a certain so, so, so if I can push you a little bit, I'll that. This, is, this is cool stuff. But I mean, I'm, I'm sure that, you know, you've heard other teachings or something. I mean, yeah. it was it just like, you know, timing, right moment. Well, you know, like, well, a lot of the teachings I was listening to, I'd been raised with that were predominantly right. Christian teachings. And if the issue right. is with, you know, the teachings and with this historical stuff um, and it's it's I always see it sometimes as it's got a motive behind it. But with Wayne Dyer, it was like there is zero motive. He had the zero threat and it went like that. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's funny how you, when you, you know, yeah. I'm pointing out the obvious here, but when you listen to certain people, 
it just seems to hit bottom, yeah, you know? Absolutely. Like, okay, I get that, I get that. Yeah. Like, oh, but when I start my, plugging in hmm. my, my headphones and stuff, it removes, I mean, I don't know if you if you study energies and frequencies and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, um, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not into that. Right. I, I right. by the way, I don't disparage or, or mm -hmm. condone, you know, or, you know, I'm not condescending about it. I'm just not into it, yeah. but I get it Yeah, yeah. because I, I think it's, it's, we all have our way to try to find mm -hmm. our peace in this yes. planet. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Absolutely. And if some people go, dude, I dig, you know, I, I'm into vibrations. I got a couple of friends who are very into frequencies, mm -hmm. you know, and he goes, that's how I find my vibe. Yeah. And I'm like, more power to you. I don't care how you find it. Just find it. <laughs> as long as it's you. Fun. Yes. But for you me, know, I was, I mean, you know, do you, you know, yeah, it's, but, but you know, cause people, I should clarify actually, cause sometimes when you talk about vibrations and frequencies, uh, it's uh, a little bit like way out there kind of thing. For me, uh, it's because there's so much noise that's going on around us all the time, all sure. the messages that's there. So that, that's what I mean by that. And I, I had the, the headphones plugged in and literally, um, because I've got visual dyslexia, so I didn't read for a long time, but now I read right. with my ears and mm. think with my mouth um so everything's mm. kind of here there and everywhere and um within what we're in now june june so since the end of january this transformation's been taking place i've listened mm. to probably about 215 books all on business and spirituality and all sorts of different wow. things from some of nice. the oldest teachers napoleon hill and earl nightingale yeah. and all these guys <clears throat> um and of course yourself um yeah and met some phenomenal people along the way and had zero anxiety attacks. Now I'm business partner with uh, Laurie Bischoff, um, whose husband was heavily into the wrestling scene and at one period of time, and uh, all of this stuff has just started opening up. And the reason you and I are talking is because mm. of a conversation that Laurie and I had, and Donald Miller, who's another one of my heroes, was just, you know, his name was broached, and she said, well, do you think, you know, we could do something? And I was like, well, mm. With all the stuff that's going on right now, let's see what happens. Uh, Donald Miller is a uh, business made simple. Right? That's the one. Business made that's a, yeah, business made, yeah. I like his stuff. By Donald's great. Like yeah. You, yeah. Know, you know, the crazy thing is I've got. I've not met him or talked to him. I, I should make it a point to reach out to that guy. And he's still not reached out to him. <laughs> you know, I just, I just, you know, it's like you admire the stuff from a distance. Yeah. It's, um, I don't know. You know, it, it's, you know, uh, this, this, I think you'll, you'll, I could say this to you. You'll get yeah, of it. Course. It's, I, I've learned not to force yeah. things, yeah. you know, and I let, I let nature, you know, guide me with its rhythms. Yeah. And as I'm saying, to some extent, I believe in vibes yeah. and frequencies and yeah. all that, right? Yeah. Because you go, uh, and everything that's happened to me up to this point, I've never, every time I force something, it never works. Yeah. That's and I it. let it flow. It's like, yeah. all right, there it is. And then you meet people, you know, you're like, oh, there you go. You were meant to be on this path. Exactly. Then. That's cool. I mean, I, I, gotcha, I was yeah. having a conversation. Um, one of our seasons has just ended. Um, and one of the girls at my co-host, she said, well, how do you see these things? And I said, to be honest with you, these days, like you, I don't try and make anything happen. I stand, I mentally imagine myself standing in a river in the north of Scotland, looking up at the mountains and the trees and everything, all beautiful. And I let things flow to me or through me. And anything that I want to pick up and hold, great. I experience it when I'm done with it. Pick it down. Mm. I'll put it down. Then move on. Um, but it's. I think if people have, if people have a hard time with that concept of, of letting go. Yeah. And by yeah. the way, when I say let go, it's not like let the world just impact you the way it's going to impact. Yeah. Obviously, we try to. We we. I just say just move in that direction. That's it. And what comes in and out of it, it just happens. Yeah. You got to keep moving though. Yeah. Because uh, as you're got to move towards something, yeah. even if it's a general direction. That's so, it. but I, I, I still find it funny now when people will say, well, why didn't you get really angry when that person disagreed with you? And I, <laughs> the first answer before I'd really thought about this was, madam, sir, you're under the delusion that I really care as to what the other person uh, is going uh, back with. Uh, now uh, I'm, I'm much more diplomatic and I'm just like, it's okay for them not to agree with me. I'm not looking right. for them to agree with me. I'm just stating yeah. with you from my life experience. So yeah, yeah, you'll you'll love you'll love this one. Years ago, I learned this lesson. It just hit me because uh, uh, I was talking to a guy. I remember we we're discussing mm -hmm. politics or something like that. And you know, I'm I'm like a, I'm an Ayn Rand, Milton Friedman <laughs> capitalist, right? And and he and I remember he's like more like you know socialist and the whole thing. And I and that's cool. I, I and he says, Victor, you have not convinced me that capitalism is a better system. I remember I looked at him, I said, oh, you know, what gave you the idea that my job is to convince you? Yeah, I said, I'm convinced. I've already done the work. Do you know what I mean? And he, he didn't know where to go with that. And, and I think it's that detachment of ego yeah. that as soon as you, I had a guy the other day, he invites me on a podcast. I, I'm doing the podcast. 
he asked me a question. I said, well, I have a controversial stance on it, right? And it was Hess selling change. And I, he goes, now, now I, I primed him. I go, I have a controversial stance yeah. on this. And he says, oh, love controversial stances. <laughs> what is it? And I said, selling has not changed. It hasn't. It's an illusion that we think yeah. it changed. And he immediately goes, bullshit. I go, wait a minute. You just want it controversial. I gave you controversial. Now you call. And it, without flinching, I said, well, just allow me to walk through the explanation. And then if you disagree, then we'll go from there. And he just like, didn't know what to do with that. He's just like, okay. And when I went through the explanation, he goes, yeah. okay, I guess you're right. And, but, but my ego had become like you said, totally detached from yeah. his reaction. And I was like, that the, the producer that was out there goes, you didn't flinch, Victor. You didn't flinch when he said bullshit. Cause he's got it kind of hard. So he goes, of course. I'm not, you know, yeah. Wow. Just like, See, I mean, it's like, for me, I, uh, I, I learned more about sales this year again. Every, and again, I turn it into a study. I'm like, if you want to make more money, well, how do you do it? You study how to make more money. And uh, I, I listened. And again, you're probably familiar with this with the, the one minute salesperson, the one minute sales manager. Are you familiar with those? They came out in like the 70s, 80s. <laughs> Oh, yeah, those are, uh, oh, what's his name? Uh, I know, yeah, yeah, there was a whole series. So I listened to these. And it now that's going to bother me. That's going to bother me. The one, I don't want to look it up. I don't want to look it up. I, I'm, I'm banking on my brain to pick it up. Um, but, but what give me, happened? Give me, give, me, give me his first, give me the initials of the I, guy. That's what I was just looking for now. <laughs> but, uh, but that's what happened is I started walking through, and I said, sales literally, like you say, is yeah. easy when you realize I'm not trying to push a painting because that's something I do. I'm not trying to put my, push my oh. books or coaching. All I'm doing is having a conversation with a person and seeing if my products can be a service to those people. And do you know what? We have closed more sales <laughs> since doing mm -hmm. that. And I work less hours and I'm more peaceful. I now study under so many different gurus and teachers from Indian yeah. gurus of uh, Sankaru um, yeah. and some of these other guys. And I'm like, this is incredible. You know, just all this amazing stuff. It's, so. it, it's finding that. And, I, and it, again, I wish we kind of lived our lives backwards. You know what I mean? Because only when you get older, do you realize all this stuff? I go, God, if I'd only known this back then, yeah. I yeah. would have been so much more at peace with life and stuff like that. Uh, but yeah, so I, you know, I've, I've gone through that process, that journey of, uh, you know, just quieting the mind, you know, and not reacting. It's, it's been a hard practice. Yeah. The, uh, you know, what's interesting is that the, uh, you know, years ago when I was, when I was going through all this, pro I went through that whole journey of different philosophers uh -huh. and all this stuff. Uh, and I settled on Ayn Rand. Uh, she, she created the, uh, the philosophy, the school of objectivism. Okay, I don't know yes, if yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so that to me was like my, like my North, uh -huh. right. Cause to me it was like, it's just the way my brain works. Yeah. But, but I think the greatest model, you know who has the greatest model for life? Go on, I'm intrigued. The greatest model, <laughs> the number one model in my book, for me, by the way, is uh, Stephen Covey, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. I've when got he, that actually on my bookshelf. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that one. So when he drew the two circles, circle yeah. of influence and circle of concern, I go, well, there it is. I can't tell you how many times I come back to that when I want to calm my brain. Yeah. I go, all right, what can we control here? That's it. You just go, what can we control? Exactly. And the rest, we just let, you know, the world do its thing. Spencer that's Johnson why I think it's the, was the name. Spencer Johnson. That's that's the one. I wouldn't have gotten that one. I, I know I've heard the name, obviously, but I, why did I think it was somebody else? I, cu I couldn't have told you who that was, actually. I listened to it. I downloaded it, and I'm like, yeah, I couldn't tell you who it was. <laughs> yeah. But, but, you know, by the way, you know, I always talk about selling, selling it hard when you know how, because I believe that the toughest part of selling today is getting in front of the person. Yes. That's the toughest yeah. part. Because once yeah. you're in front, then we take this philosophy of like, here's what I got. Yeah. Does it line up with yours? If yay, yay. If no, that's cool too. See, I found that. Um, other thing. Now, I, should, I suppose I should tell you author, artist, personal development coach. Those are the sure. three areas that I, cool. I, I optimize in. For me, the crazy thing is this if I'm working with a client, for example, and I'll say to them, okay, I specialize in cat portraits. Facebook has literally in the millions of groups that are out there, all these cat portraits. I put one picture up with me standing, arms folded, muscles bulging, women love it, ah. and, and the cat portrait next to me. And they're like, oh, John, that's amazing. I start a conversation with them there and then, add them, we chat a little bit more, we build up. Before I know it, we've got a sale. The crazy thing is when they then find out he's actually a personal performance coach and an author, let's buy his books, let's buy his courses, let's get him to coaches. I'm like, this is amazing. <laughs> it really is. is. Amazing. We're, we're, it's a, it, this is a good business. If you have real value to offer people, it's a great business to be in. That's it, definitely. That's, but, but, but I like to highlight, if you have real value to offer, there's yes. a phrase right there. That's oh, yeah. that, 
because I, I've, I've do a lot of events and you know, it's like, I run into a lot of people and it's like, you know, you're not, you're offering crap that you can get yeah. at the bookstore. Yeah. Well, you know, it. I think people want some insights yeah. and help. So well, like, by the way, the only thing I'll say is go back and grab some of the clips on what we recorded already. You got to use some of the stuff. I think it's, because it's that's a great conversation. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Yeah. Definitely. Okay. Yeah. Okay. 